Hi, it's me again. Okay, so, um, sorry it's been a minute. Um, I wanted to go back over natural law, um, just because the first couple of videos that I made about natural law, um, it was beginner stuff. So I want to go back over it and go more into the intermediate level. Um, this is for my second book, um, The Intermediate's Guide to the Mystery Sciences. So it's in chapter two of uh, part one of the second book. It's called The Unseen Microcosm. So the first part of that is natural law revisited. So we just go more in depth into natural law. So as we recall from the first book, uh, the, the first natural law is a principle of mentalism. Um, I'm gonna just read the intro, <laughs> sorry. In our beginner stages of mystery sciences, we examine the principles of natural law for the first time with great speculation. We look to our elders to show us the way. The Kabbalion's descriptions of the physics of the universe in seven principles is a pillar of occult knowledge. Let us revisit these foundational concepts with a better understanding of them. To understand the unseen, we must give it form. The principle of mentalism. The all is mind. The universe is mental. This principle embodies the truth that manifestation requires only concentration. In a matrix where the generative properties are bundles of energy clothed in nerve clusters, receiving and shooting out vibrations into the magnetic fields surrounding the point of origin, my best shot at making my thoughts magically appear is to concentrate on them. You're always, if you are always worried, the object of your concern becomes your concentration. Now you are manifesting that which you fear. If a look back at this principle does nothing else, it should remind us that what we think we create. And so scientifically, I guess you would go into that as like, imagine Minecraft. Okay. If you've ever played Minecraft, you ever watched anybody play Minecraft or really any video game, um, that is a mental world, a synthetic mental world um, and as we are moving into the metaverse we need to really kind of understand how that mental world works um, there are levels outside of the physical plane where thoughts are things legit actually there so the physical three-dimensional realm uh, is your waking consciousness right your waking consciousness inhabits and is active in the physical three-dimensional realm your subconscious is active in the fourth dimension, which is when your body is inactive in the third dimension. So the fourth dimension has less limitations, but still structure. Um, the fourth dimension subconscious definition, like definitive trait is that there's no inhibition, you know, in a dream state, there's no in inhibition. You can do whatever you want, literally whatever you want. If you think about something, it magically appears. You think about somebody, it magically appears, or you get magically pulled to them or whatever. There's less limitation there, but there's still interaction and there's still that, you know, learning aspect of growth where you already have preconceived notions that you throw into it. You know what I'm saying? Like in your dream state, you see your mother, okay? Imagine you see your mother, right? Whether she's still alive or whether she's dead or you see her as your age or as a child, whatever it is, you recognize this image, that you've created and projected to interact with as your mother, okay? You already have a subconscious connection, understanding history, backstory with this image of this internal desire that you've projected to interact with. Somehow you have an internal desire to interact with this person, so you do in the fourth dimension, um, astral plane, right? So cool, but you have to understand that whatever comes out of that person's mouth is not coming from that person. It's coming from you. It is your words coming out of their mouth because that's how you need it presented to you. You need to hear your mother say it. You know what I mean? Like that's it. Um, and that's cool, but that's how the third dimension works as well in a more structured, less freedom type of way. When you meet somebody new or when you come in contact with somebody old or any interaction you have, any op opportunity for choice you have is given to you because that's how you need to receive it. So tough love situations, um, 
those are also needed. And that's an experience that you're giving yourself because you concentrate on the desire that manifested that physical delivery system for your opportunity to make a choice concerning this situation. Does that make sense? Anyway, you manifest things in your subconscious mind instantly in the dream world, but in physicality, in your waking state, you manifest things from your subconscious slower. <laughs> so it could be, you know, years in the making, or it could be months in the making, or it could be hours, you know, depending on how concentrated you are on this concept. You know, if you're always thinking about money problems, you're always going to have money problems. You know, if you're always thinking about you can't, you can't, you can't, then you won't. If you're always thinking that you're sick, then your body will believe you and you will be sick. You know what I mean? You manifest things depending on how hard you concentrate on them. But also, you know, it's it's a level, It's there's levels to it. You know, subconsciously you manifest it and then consciously you interact with it. And that's the whole point. That's literally the whole point of experience in the body so that you can interact with things that you've already created in higher realms. And the whole point of that is so that you can grow through choices. And the best way to grow through choices is to make the wrong ones or to make the counterproductive ones. I wouldn't say wrong, like right and wrong doesn't matter. Counterproductive. You could take the long way or you could take the really fucking long way, right? Choice is yours. And that's the whole point of this experience is to give yourself choices to learn and grow. So it's fine. You really can't make the wrong choice. But in the third dimension waking state, you know, there is a lot of inhibitions on the choices that you can make because of socially accepted parameters. You know, like you can't just cuss people out because you're in a hurry. You know, you have to be patient in public. Otherwise you get arrested or whatever. Right. Um, and these are put in place to sort of like give you, I don't know, a path. Like, you know what I mean? Like a just, you know, don't just be wild and free and spend, you know, lifetimes here just fucking off. You got shit to do, you know, so don't, don't get distracted is what it is. Um, but, you know, even the distractions can be beneficial depending on how you manifest them. That's what I'm trying to say. Everything is manifested. Everything that you interact with was manifested by your subconscious on a higher level before you ever ran into it consciously. Boom. Principle of mentalism. Uh, the same is true in the opposite direction. If instead of manifestation, for example, astral projection was our goal, we would look to the principle of mentalism to discover how to repel the forms and receive the force inside of them. This is what's called seeing the unseen. It's not, um, it's not like you think it is. It's not like you, you can see ghosts. I mean, like, yeah, that's a thing, but that's not what seeing the unseen is. That's not what eyes to see and ears to hear is. Seeing the unseen is literally just having the wisdom to read between the lines and forms cloud that, you know, like it looks and you accept it as a, a word and you label it and that's all it could ever be. Uh, but if you reject the form, you know, in the dream where you see your mother, if in the dream state you acknowledge that it's not actually your mother and you, you're speaking to it and you say, why do you look like my mother? Well, now you're engaging with the force behind the form consciously, you know, and, and the realm of mentalism at that point, once you acknowledge that you're interacting with the force and not the form, the form of that force might change. It might, you know, become a sphere. It might become whatever, whatever image of the desire you created it to be originally started out as, as a blob before it got, you know, before it became your mother's form. I don't know. Whatever the force is behind it will reveal itself to you once you acknowledge the form is not real. That's how mentalism works. Um, it works forward and backward. So in this situation, concentration is key to the direction of movement toward origin or force as opposed to towards space which is expansion and form. To change the direction of force, we must create a vacuum. Find a place filled with darkness and use it as a portal to enter the realms of light. The Lady Fortune, Dion Fortune, said, evil must be conceived of esoterically as a limitation which enables pressure to be raised as the rejection, which enables concentration to be achieved. In other words, the buildup comes from being held down. The hero springs forth from the environment impacted by the villain. 
Superpowers appear when situations arise which require them. It is always the function of the opposition to produce stability. You know, the, the above is supported by the below. Um, so if I want to go up first, I must push off the ground. And that thing too is like, it's like Boyle's Law, right? So, um, so pressure and volume are inversely proportionate to each other. And uh, what that means is the more pressure you have, the less volume you have, or the more volume you have, the less pressure you have. Like one, you can't, you know, you got to pick one. There's a scale constantly. So like when you breathe, you fill your lungs up while well, you have more volume, right? But that puts pressure on all your other, you know, breathing muscles and structure and bone and all that, right? So then when you take the pressure off of that, you have less volume, right? So it just, you know, whatever. It's, I'm not explaining it right, but pressure and volume are inversely proportionate and that is applicable to the law of mentalism. <laughs> anyway, let's not get too carried away. Um, okay, so the principle of correspondence, um, digging back into that. As above, so below as within, so without, on earth as it is in heaven. This principle embodies the truth that, as Toth said, look the above or look the below, the same shall ye find. The cosmos are a reflection of the soul. The soul is a reflection of the cosmos. The concentrated force of consciousness to express itself outwardly is equal to the amount of concentrated force required to return to self inwardly. Introspection needs the same attention as self-expression. And the, if the only way to accomplish this task is to push off of the self-expression energy and aim towards the introspection energy, then so be it. Um, the principle of correspondence teaches us that all forces have their multi-layered arrangement of parallel force complexes. Imagine it like the nine realms in Norse mythology. Each realm is in alignment with a realm both above and below it. The same can be said of the sephir on the tree of life, the sacred chakras, and the bodies of the spirit according to each plane of existence. This is the harmonic series of musical notes in an octave. Each note adds a degree of quality to the tone of the sound. This is Jacob's Ladder. This is that which we must climb in order to get to the higher levels of consciousness to which we aspire. Thomas H. Burgoyne clarifies the purpose of the principle of correspondence in his iconic work, <clears throat> The Light of Egypt, by saying, where mind is not, there are no symbols, no ideas, no manifestations. The spirit has not yet reached that point in its evolutionary journey where it can yet crystallize its projected force, power, or ideas into forms. For everything that is, is the outcome of divine thought and expresses within itself the symbol of its being. It's the force behind the form. This is the arcana of the law of correspondences. So what he's saying is that everything that you see in your waking state in front of you was manifested long before it, it came into physicality. It, this is the crystallized form version of the force that was created above, before, subconsciously. You know what I'm saying? So correspondence tells us that as there are a ridiculous amount of keys on the piano, so are there a ridiculous amount of transitional vibrational frequencies from thought to f formation, manifestation, right? So it goes through a, a whole bunch of changes before it crystallizes and becomes what it presents itself to you as, which is why third dimensional space time is slower or it seems slower. You know, like you could be asleep and in your dream, you have a three week long vacation, but you wake up, it's only been an hour. You know what I mean? That's the time is played out differently here because it's, everything is crystallized and it's just solid and just slow, you know, whereas in the mental realm, everything's fast. Um, but it's, it's the different notes that you need to take, make it, you know, have acknowledgement of, you need to, to acknowledge the fact that between middle C and high C, there's a bunch of different notes, you know, and you have to climb slowly, step through them one at a time. You can't just snap your fingers and, and make it appear or make it happen. You know, you slowly have to build that. You have to build it and manifest it with your concentrated thought and with your focused action. 
and then also understand that when when you dream about things when you daydream when you night dream when you focus your mental energy into whatever it is you are unintentionally manifesting it into solidity you are unintentionally unaware that you are building and solidifying a solid construct of that idea that desire that image that whatever that will present itself to you in your in your physical waking life it doesn't matter you know like you and the harm in that comes in like like it, when you masturbate you know if you constantly masturbate to the same thought you are feeding energy to that scenario so you're manifesting it somewhere on some plane and some reality it's happening because you feed so much intense energy into it you know what I mean so you have to be really conscious and aware of what you let your mind create thoughts that you think are creations that you create and if you don't want a certain type of reality in the real world but you feel as though you know it's just a dream or it's just imagination or it's not hurting anybody you know you, you let your mind concentrate on it you you don't know it's not hurting anybody you know what I mean like it's actually happening like what was that movie um it was a Will Ferrell movie and he was like Harold Crick was his name and he was a um just a regular guy you know but he started hearing this voice like narrating his life like as he's brushing his teeth and he can hear it and it turns out there's an author across town who's writing a book about a character, about a character that's exactly like him. That's him. It's essentially him. And at the end of the book, the character dies, you know? So, like, she gives, like, a like a, a heads up in the middle of the book. Like, little did he know, you know, he was about to die or whatever. And he's, like, freaking out because he can hear the narration. And he's like, how am I going to die? Why am I going to die? I'm not ready to die. And then he, like, reassesses his whole life because he's about to die and he's like well if I'm about to die I want to be happy before I do that so he just acts totally out of character which changes the story <laughs> it's great it's beautiful but um it's, it's sort of like that you know um when you focus your concentrated energy on anything you're creating it somewhere in some realm in some reality it's real it exists because you are focusing on it because you and you created it with your mind or with your concentrated thought so there's that um, okay, principle of vibration. Nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything vibrates. Movement is half of the prime duality. The other half is inertia. Combined, the two create what our senses interpret as all that is. And yet, from our limited sensory perceptions, all that is, is not. For it is only the movement of the diffusions of light as they express the original thought and return to the thinker once finished. We are a camera for the thinker, an angle of the limitless perception of the all. Walter Russell told us that. We have made our peace with the fact that, we, that all we can perceive is in constant motion. We now need to contemplate why. Why is everything in motion all of the time? What we should first consider is the, in the mystery of vibration is how we perceive it. We perceive vibration in five ways according to our body's five senses. These perceptions are interpreted by our brain via our nervous system. The nervous system allows the vibrations of sound, light, touch, smell, and taste to transmit their frequencies to us in a language that our bodies can communicate with. We smell the flowers. We see the flowers. We taste the flowers. We feel the flowers. These are four tones in a harmonic series stemming from the movements of the molecules which hold together the form of the idea of the flower <laughs> like it's a it's an intricate system of electromagnetism and thought projection into image things but it's it's what we call reality you know reality functions because of vibration <laughs> because that's how we can interpret it that's how we can interpret form altogether it has to be vibrating for our physical sensory perception to to even register it so our physical body is only designed to register movement so we perceive everything that moves <laughs> essentially but it's not moving it's a whole thing like I don't even know how to explain it like it it's it's perceived as moving but it's really not it's just like electrical I don't know anyway um 
So um, there are two ways molecules are held together through ionic bonds, which is magnetism, and through covalent bonds, which is immediate contact. And this is much like a relationship bond. Two or more atoms share electrons while at the same time sharing positrons. And the simple action of finding each other creates a bond which gives the once individual atoms a new form to become one. But they are neither of them what they once were. Together, they are different. Together, they harmonize. The first tone, what we perceive as the visual data, combines with the second tone, what we perceive as the odorous data. And these two tones attach themselves to a third, which is texture data. And now we have three tones harmonizing together to create the form and idea of the flowers, manifested and solidified into our conscious reality. And then something magical happens. We give the idea a name, flower. The moment we accept this limitation of what we are perceiving in our mind, it can be nothing more. It's a flower. <laughs> Not only have you taken all the microseconds to register and receive the light information, process it in your head, run through the files of memory <laughs> that are connected and do a search inside your brain for connected imagery or knowledge or information from old files right and then pulled up the old files similar to this received data and then um, compared it and you have like an AI decided not even like you're not even thinking you're just processing at this point you're just processing comparing and pulling up the most recent files or whatever and then you give it a name oh this is very similar to this so they must be the same thing and now boom to become one and your present interaction with the flower is now solidified as a past recollection of an interaction with a flower. <laughs> Time space, boom. So anyway, you limit, um, you limit the data in front of you by, by labeling it. So if you could see the unseen in this situation, what you would see is that it's not a flower at all. It's um, a collection of ionic bonds and covalent bonds of atoms of tiny universes that are holding hands <laughs> and um, projecting like pixels, you know, of, of a whole idea. But together, they make the whole idea. But individually, none of them are that. They're, none of them are any of that. They're all just blank paper just waiting for you to assign them <laughs> an idea <laughs> it's nothing until you name it <laughs> you know <laughs> like it's I mean it's not nothing but like it's it's not solid until you in your mind give it a name <laughs> you know <laughs> like there's power in a name but anyway um <laughs> I'm super hoping that that was not extra complicated I'm just gonna keep going though maybe that's the why maybe force becomes form through vibration. It makes sense. Movement is desire. Inertia is resistance to movement. Um, so like movement is like your, what you want to do. And then inertia is like the rules telling you, you can't do that. <laughs> you know. Um, this is why we want what we can't have. The dance of movement is the feminine masculine energies entangled in frictionless motion through entropy which is the form of space-time. As above, so below. Vibration is like any other movement. The positive and negative energies chase each other until both return to source. It's all connected. So when one thing moves, everything moves. Hence, a wave field. A picture evolves into a movie as it drops into the lower planes from the mental plane. Um, I'm sorry, I hope I explained that. <laughs> really, I hope I explained it well and not just maddeningly confusing. Okay, uh, the principle of polarity. Deeper look into that. Everything has its equal opposite. Everything has its poles. But opposites are alike in nature, yet different in degree. All of the colors of the rainbow are different in degree, but alike in nature. Opposites are still masculine and feminine energies, so everything is inherently one or the other. The trick is to combine them in such a way as to balance the water with fire and create air. Polarity is the conjunction process of the alchemical transmutation and takes place in the Anahata, Chakra is your heart chakra. Balance is life. Transmuting darkness into light is balancing 
polarities, period, in everything, always. It's a lifestyle, it's tiny decisions, clear intentions, and concentrated energies. When you are working in an anahata, you have to pull energies from the lower chakras to empower it. Sometimes the lower vibrations can add an aspect of lust, jealousy, arrogance, pride. These energies weaken the anahata because the anahata works on love energy. Be cautious of that intention while polarizing your life. And my goal with explaining polarization, um, redefining it, I guess, is that now that you understand, um, you know, the four pole magnet and how that applies to literally everything in the, in the law of gender, um, giving you positive, negative ends of the magnet, um, you need to sort of apply that to the fourth dimension, um, as we, you know, enter the metaverse and the, the virtual reality that is fast approaching, um, as a synthetic transition between body and spirit which is good, but it'll be bad first. It'll be bad and then it'll be good. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, um, the Anahata is your portal, you know, like you, you are a fourth dimensional being. And the reason that we know that is because you can interact third dimensionally. You wouldn't be able to do that unless you were a fourth dimensional being. Um, you know, the first dimension is the dot and it can't go anywhere. The second dimension is the line, you know, well, that's, it can interact with the dot because it's a series of dots right next to each other, touching each other like covalent bonds, like atoms, right? That's second dimension. Second dimension can be a line or it could be a bunch of dots, right? It has interaction with the realm below it. And third dimension, you know, it can interact with the dot and the line and the sphere, you know, like it, it can go lots of places. It, all it has to do is curve that line and now it's a circle. You know what I mean? Like it's cool. It can do way more than the second dimension can do. Same thing with fourth dimension. Fourth dimension can do more than the third dimension can do. That's what we are. We're fourth dimensional beings. And we can do that. We understand that because in our waking state, in our physical body, we are three dimensions. And then in our sleeping state, in our mental body, astral body, um, we can do more. Um, and that's um, an ability we wouldn't have unless we were fourth dimensional beings. So because we're already fourth dimensional beings, we have access to the fourth dimension. We just don't really know how to do that in our waking state. So we make synthetic, you know, video games and online, whatever, you know, that's our synthetic access to the fourth dimension. Um, well, we can do that naturally, uh, if we would just leave our body but we don't know how to do that. So we can only do it in our sleep. <laughs> so, um, if we meditate enough, you know, you can leave your body willfully, uh, with practice, or you could just join the synthetic version of the fourth dimension and, you know, hop online and, and do kind of what we're doing now. Um, which is a really good transitional step to get from, you know, where we've always been to where we're trying to go. Um, but you know, there again, you give a man anything beautiful and he will destroy it. <laughs> it will totally destroy it. But, you know, eventually it'll be fine. So, um, polarity, once you understand everything has its equal opposite, then you can understand the mirror realm. And the mirror realm is essentially the fourth dimension. So, take the, the Tesseract. Okay, the Tesseract is the fourth dimensional cube, right? Cube is three dimensions. If you want to expand on that, you go to the Tesseract, and that's literally just the cube twice. <laughs> like, you just double up the cube, and now you have a Tesseract, um, which is cool. But we can't really wrap our heads around it in our waking state, because in our waking state, we're three-dimensional. In our sleeping state, we're four-dimensional, so in our sleeping state, we, we'll get it, you know, whatever. But if you want to make that transition, you need to double everything. Everything you see, everything you know, everything you are needs to be doubled. And one of those sides needs to be positive and the other one needs to be negative. So it's like, um, you know, like Rudolf Steiner explained it like, like gloves. You know, a glove is um, <clears throat> two sides sewn together to become three-dimensional, right? Two, two dimensional things, right? You sew them together and now it's three-dimensional. Mirror images of each, you know, like one, one piece of cloth for the front, one piece of cloth for the back, and you've sewn them together now. That's what we need to do. That's all you have to do is polarize everything, thoughts, ideas, images, conversation, polarize it. And then um, you've now made it fourth dimensional. 
So what we take from that, we understand our dreams better. If we understand the law of polarity, um, you know, maybe you presented your, your idea, your desire to yourself in your dream state as your mother, uh, because that's the polarity of, you know, your waking consciousness interaction with it, right? Or maybe because you manifested your mother in your dream state, you are going to get a call from your dad tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like polarity exists. It's real. Um, and once you can willfully polarize things, well, then you're not being viscerally attacked by the opposite of what you want. <laughs> you know, you can recognize it as, you know, it's not this, it's the opposite of that, that I'm, I'm searching for, that I'm craving, or that's calling me, or whatever, you know, just, it's important to understand, as we go through the transition of 3D to 4D, polarization is a key factor in the fourth dimension, and if you can visualize it in the third dimension, then you're halfway there. Um, okay, principle of rhythm. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The tides balance. Rhythm compensates. The principle of rhythm tells us that there can be no life without death. For the extension of life is given only in the equal extension of death. There is only as much darkness as there is light. The amplitude of the trough is equal to the amplitude of the crest of the wave cycle. This tells us that the seasons move in a pattern. The earth moves in a pattern. The stars move in a pattern. The atoms which contain our spirit move in a pattern. All life exists and is held in bondage to a pattern of movement. If we understand the pattern, we can move with it and not be moved by it. Even mental energies are moved through patterns. The physics of the mind are pristine and efficient. In this mental universe, to master the mind is to master the universe. It's coding. It's all, you know, if you understand coding, then you understand the mental realm and how it works. There's algorithms in place for certain things to happen. Like you, in the, in the physical three-dimensional world, you have babies, right? And that's how you buy yourself time get more health, you know, level up or whatever, you know, your body is inevitably going to die, but you extended your consciousness in another body and it is developed in a different environment and raised differently because you're doing it yourself and whatever, da, da, da. but like, it's still, it's still, it's still your cells, you know, making copies like that's what babies are so in the mental realm um we do this the same way um but faster and <laughs> more and um with greater intensity and with more data content i guess um so once you can understand the patterns like our consciousness can't understand dna <laughs> like fully like we have no idea what some of this shit does but we we can we can map it, you know, so far we've gotten to mapping and that's cool. And, um, sort of like semi definitions of what each, you know, <laughs> strand does. And, you know, this one's a C and this one's an A and this one's a G and the, you know, C and G are good together. And, you know, but if you try, it doesn't connect with the other, like it's cool. Um, but that's like surface information, <laughs> you know, like we've barely begun to scratch the surface, but it's a pattern. We know it's a pattern. So we know it's a pattern that helps us understand um, where we should be focusing our observational skills, right? If you know it's a pattern, then you know it's a code. If you know it's a code, then you know there's a code originator. Somebody wrote that code, right? If you can figure out the code, it gets you closer to the person who wrote it, right? You can sort of see their signature and all the little tiny details. Um, and the person who wrote it is you. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It was always you. Uh, because I am you and you are you and there is no, it's just, there's just one, <laughs> there's only one person up in the ninth dimension, bored as fuck, um, <laughs> just creating movement and desire, probably unintentionally, <laughs> just because out of boredom. But anyway, um, our, our goal, I guess, is to get back to that ninth dimension of boredom. And in order to do so, we have to play out all of the desires and experience all of the growth that the ninth dimensional us needs so um thank you and you're welcome <laughs> for that purpose but um you know 
finding our path back um, to source is easier when we can discern the pattern of rhythm. All things follow a pattern. All things are coded. There's a code underlining everything. So atomic structures, geome geometric principles, um, movements of the cosmos. Movements of the cosmos are mirrored in <laughs> food, <laughs> like fruit. Like if you cut a tomato, you know, like you see the inside of it, like it's structure is exactly the same as like in the cosmos. It's incredible. Anyway, um, I don't have time to go into that, but it's legit. It's everything as above, so below, always. But there's patterns and, uh, and coding, and if you can differentiate, um, you can navigate. That's the goal. Okay, the principle of cause and effect. Um, karma, essentially. Every cause has its effect, and every effect has its cause. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. Interchange is inevitable. So long as there are diffusions of light scattered across space-time, there will be entanglements of energies which communicate by a form. Rhythmic, balanced interchange is the ideal observation of cause and effect. That's Walter Russell. When the, I, when the energies in your life have been polarized and balanced, you have created a cause which gives birth to effect. Likewise, when you make any choice or movement, its effect is planted as well. Rhythm compensates through cause and effect. What we should remember from looking back on this principle is that we create causes on all planes of existence simultaneously. Every cause we create in waking physical life has its cause in all of the higher planes as well. The degree is different, but the energy, the desire underlining it, the force behind the form is the same. It works the other way too. Ideas we create on the higher planes of mind become manifested forms in the lower planes of existence. Our bodies can have a physical reaction to these energies if they're not balanced. The reality of the mind is manifested into the reality of the physical plane, and the accepted realities of the physical plane become causes in the higher realms. It is an endless cycle of energy interchange and a constant struggle between darkness and light. Cause and effect are embodiments of karma. Karma, you see, is what is described in the words of Hamilton's Aaron Burr. Okay, I'm a Hamilton nerd. I could recite it for you word for word, but I'm only gonna I'm only gonna quote just this one point because it, it matches with cause and effect. So in um, in Burr's song, wait for it, right? He says, you know, this is what he says life or he says love, but I'm talking about karma. Karma doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and it takes and it takes and we keep living anyway. We rise and we fall and we break and we make our mistakes. And um, it's a really good explanation of, of karma. You know, the rise and fall of the rhythm of karma, of polarities, up and down, positive and negative, gender, masculine and feminine. Um, the coding of it is a wave. It's everything, inertia, entropy, it all happens in a wave field. So the wave field supports the wave itself. So what we're witnessing is not the wave itself, but the wave field reflecting the motion of the wave itself. Um, and that's really hard to explain if you don't know anything about physics or light properties. <laughs> but um, anyway, karma is that cause and effect. So take that back to uh, what we've previously been talking about with the other natural laws and um, thoughts and concentrated mental mentalism um, on certain desires or ideas or notions or whatever. Those are causes. Um, in the mental realm, you're, whatever you think about, you're creating a cause. And it does on its own, like a child that you have in real life, grow on its own with its own perception and awareness and decision-making skills. <laughs> like everything is a cause, and every cause is a living entity. <laughs> and um, that's why, that's how we have so many people, and animals, and plants, and rocks, and that's why there's so many degrees of everything. And because <laughs> cause, cause and effect, manifested effect from disorganized cause, it's beautiful. Um, anyway, last one, principle of gender. Before this video is like, it's already 40 minutes long. Principle of gender reminds us that we are a magnet. All energies are magnetic, and all sense perceptions are absorbed recordings of light. All light is entangled with all dark. In one plane of existence, light is what another plane perceives as dark. 
gender manifests on all plane. Limitations exist in the physical plane because there is a plane which is limitless. And that's that uh, mirror dimension situation I was talking about with polarity. So, um, you know, what's when it's daytime in the physical world, it's nighttime in the mental realm. And when it's nighttime in the mental realm, it's, you know, daytime in the vice versa, whatever. So, um, therefore, limitlessness exists in the physical plane as well in one form or another, or more likely to a degree in all forms. Gender tells us that the in the black, there is white. In the blind, there is sight. In the wrong, there is right, because in the darkness, there is light. Things are not only one thing or another. They are always both. Every atom has both gendered energies maintaining its balance. Every magnet has poles. Every body is a combination of momentum and inertia, not just as building blocks, but also as batteries. It is the interchange of energies which allows there to be more energy. But more energy means more entropy. More entropy means more space time. This is the reason for the curvature of space. It is a constant unfolding and refolding movement, a polarized cause and effect, which rhythmically vibrates mentally on all corresponding planes of existence. <laughs> and that's how you squeeze all seven of the natural laws into one sentence, boom. There was once a time when our bodies were androgynous. This is when in the womb, we developed either a femi feminine or masculine reproductive system. The clitoris could easily have become a penis, but somewhere along the way, the balance required a choice. That choice was made by our spirit before the body was even ready to make contact with its intended environment. Gender expression in form is one of the first choices that we make. And that's for polarity purposes. Like legit, that's it. Because in your subconscious state, you... The way that I see it is my, my kids are a projection of where I was in my growth while I was pregnant with them. And let me explain. Um, my first child I had when I was 20 and um, they are a reflection of me at that age, at that point in my growth. And of course, you know, they continue to grow on, of their own accord, with their own choices and their own awareness. But what I multiplied, what I produced, was essentially an aspect of myself, um, but in in solid form, it's a polarized version of you know what subconsciously. I wanted or I was at the time. Um, and then, you know, progressively as you have more children in different times of your life, it's the same thing, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I've got one kid that's got anger issues and that's because when I was pregnant with that child, I was angry. <laughs> it was, I was very angry all the time. And then I have one child that's just really sensitive because I was in a vulnerable state at that point in my life. And then, you know, like it, you, when you make copies of, of your spirit in that way, um, it's, it's like a, it's like a snapshot, I guess, or like a, you know, but it, it evolves on its own after you, you know, print it out and put it somewhere, it becomes its own thing. Um, but you, you know, you give it the coding, the underlined coding, um, to manifest and it, and the memory of the algorithms to do so. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's why you have DNA that matches your parents because your spirit is a, an extension of theirs and um, utilized their DNA coding to replicate its own shell. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't know if that makes sense to you. It makes sense in my head, so I don't know if I'm explaining it right. But anyway, um, gender expression um, is a polarity in the third dimension and the fourth dimension, they are equal opposites. So understand that concept better and you can create causes more aligned with what you, what effects that you want. I hope I explained that well. <laughs> Creating causes is, is um, it's like a cheat. You know, if you can figure out how to, it's like chess. So if you, 
you want to change your situation, you need to change your environment. And if there's blockages or obstacles, then you need to move them or you need to get around them. If I can, I can control me and I can move me wherever I want, but there's limitations, you know, depending on which part of me I want to move, I can only move in certain ways and only certain spaces. If I want to move the other player, that's a little bit more difficult. If I want the other player to move out of my way or to move to a certain trap that I've set, I need, I need structured causes to create that scenario. So um, the best way to move people is either put something in front of them that will attract them or repel them. You want them to move toward or away. So that's a, a cause, that's a creating a cause. Um, if I'm a boss and I want an employee to quit because I don't want the legal ramifications of having fired them, um, I need to s arrange the situation to where they just don't want to come in to work or, <laughs> you know, like their presence there is not welcomed or appreciated or they're just miserable. If I, if I make the environment miserable enough, um, the, the employee will quit on their own and I won't have to fire them. Um, same scenario, if I want someone or some obstacle in my path to be moved, I need to create causes to do so. I don't need to sit here and bitch about the fact that they're in my way. That's not helping anybody <laughs> at all. Um, I need to create causes that would do us both justice. Um, and that's a slippery slope and that's where choice comes in. So, you know, you can, you can push them or you can, you know, bait them, <laughs> I guess. Um, but it's all, it's all just figuring it out, you know, and watching the effects rise from your causes. And, um, that's one of those things too. Every choice is like learning from your mistakes. So sometimes the causes you create destroy you. And then sometimes they have beautiful effects and it's all controlled by you. So yeah, there's the, um, almost hour long video, I'm sorry, <laughs> of going back over the principles of natural law from the first book, but uh, the second book is more in depth because you have more knowledge to, you know, knowledge base to build on and understand. You can understand more of the same thing by going over it again. Um, I'll probably go over it a final time in the last book just to redefine it for a new perspective um, once we get that new perspective. But um, so yeah, we're in the second book now, look at us go. And I'm just kind of skipping around by, you know, what I feel like needs to be recorded at the time. And that's kind of how I'm writing it too. <laughs> so I'm still writing the second book and I have like 148 pages and I haven't completed anything yet, but I'm working on all of it here and there. But, um, let me know if you have any questions or if there's a topic that I should cover that, you know, you're curious about or to go back over and elaborate on. Thank you very much.